for those of you that know me, I'm not going to be talking about implants and things like that today. Uh, it's talking about a form of artificial intelligence. I, I don't think yet it's regarded as a part of artificial intelligence, but, but clearly, as you'll see, it is. Um, so I guess in years ahead, you'll see, oh yes, this is now artificial intelligence. It's a new area. But essentially, rather than constructing neural networks from a computer-based system, it's constructing neural networks from a biological system using biological neurons. It's a lot easier doing it that way, really. Um, but it, this today, is, I want to look at um, what they are, what biological neural networks are, culturing neural networks, how you do it, uh, some of the technical aspects involved so you know exactly how it's done, um, some of the problems associated with it and some of the issues, and then a little bit different from uh, some of my normal presentations, going to look at some of the philosophy underlying it because uh, the main thing there is that with artificial intelligence, as we know, there's been an awful lot of philosophical discussion to do with consciousness and uh, is this brain alive and, and, and how close is it to a human brain. And a lot of philosophers have made a lot of mileage out of that. They've toured the world at conferences and uh, sold lots and lots of books. So I want to pick on some of the things that they've said and uh, see how they relate to this form of artificial intelligence. Essentially, it's picking up some mud and throwing it back at the philosophers that have made a lot of mileage out of comparing computers with human brains and so on. And, but then to look at some of the consequences as such brains as these are developed as such artificial neural nets. Um, I mean, even, even with a computer-based neural network, uh, you've got the possibility there if you create it big enough and it's in a body and can do things, then uh, uh, you know, when, when it makes decisions, how does that affect us? There are lots of questions there. With this type of neural network, the questions are even more in your face. Why do this sort of biological neural network? Well, why not? Uh, it's uh, nice research, it's interesting, it's exciting. Um, the, the University of Reading, where I'm from, said, no, you, you can't just say why not. You have to put on academic reasons for this. So the academic reason, well, one of them is we want to actually look at this biological brain and grow it and develop it and see how it actually functions. For example, how do memories appear in the brain. If this, the, the brain is in a robot body, as you'll see, and the robot body moves around, so the brain remembers things and acts on those memories. But how are the memories stored? We don't really know how that occurs in a human brain. And, and if we have problems such as Alzheimer's disease, dementia, which is due to do with memory dysfunctioning in some way, or the recall of memory, or the, the, the dealing with the memory, what exactly is the problem, and how do we deal with it? Well, with our little model brain, if we can understand some of the basics of memory, then maybe we can try and deal with it. Um, the same sort of thing which, which we can do directly, what happens when some of the neurons die, can we get the rest of the brain to learn how to do some of the things it didn't do in the first place? And how do we do that? Can we add neurons? Can we add stem cells to help it, to affect it? With our little model brain, we can try and do that. And that, that then goes into extending memory and even extending life. There's, there's a lot of, uh, I think it's now one of the exciting areas, people looking at life extension. Why not all live to be 200 or 300 or whatever it happens to be? Well, this is one, one way we can look at extending the life of the brain. <coughs> that when it's getting a little bit tired and you start to forget things, add a few neurons and keep going, that sort of thing. Um, and also trying to understand some of the basic ideas of learning, what's going on in the brain, and clearly the future for robots. Robots can have perhaps computers controlling them, but maybe they can also have their own brain just like you and I have. So what's, what's the main idea with what we're doing? 
Well, we're culturing, and I've, I've used, it's not a misspelling for those of you that have seen it. If in a technical world, we call them neurons. And in more in the biological world, they are called neurons. So this is education here. The, the, the words mean exactly the same thing. But if you see neuron, it, uh, there's a song. I don't know if you know it in English. You know, you say tomato and I say tomato. Um, different pronunciations of the same. It's a curi I know in the Slav language, this, this is how the word is. But English has all these weird connotations. And neuron and neuron is exactly the same thing. So I thought I would use some of them here and some of them there, just, just to confuse you in true academic fashion. But essentially it's culturing, growing neurons or neurons, and you as a brain, and then giving them a body, a robot body. The body could, could be anything. I mean, it can be a simulation or it can be a physical robot body. If it's a physical robot body, then you know, it could be Asimo, the, the Honda walking robot, if we wanted. So it doesn't really matter. Um, and getting it to, this is getting the brain through its body to interact with its environment, um, have sensory input, and, and then move around in it and so on. So for, for those of you, um, that are into more fiction or literature, it relates very much. If you've read any of Kafka, I think Kafka would, would enjoy himself this morning if he was here. A lot of what he wrote, Metamorphosis and so on, relates exactly to this sort of thing. If your brain suddenly appears in another body, how does it feel, what's it like, and so on. So this is, I love to use the word, this is very Kafka-esque. So, uh, um, and for, is, is Vera here yet? I, okay. Oh, is, is, is Vera is, has come yet? Oh, Vera, yeah. Because Kafka, of course, is, is very much related to Prague and buried in Zhishkov, which is... Uh, uh, so it's, it's very, very a, a Prague-centric presentation, I have to say. <laughs> there we go. Inspired by Kafka. Um, how does it work? Right, We're, we have a physical robot, which, which you'll see. I mean, we, our, it's nice on wheels because it's nice and simple. We don't need to worry about it too much. But it, it can have legs, whatever you want. Um, but of course, then it's, it's got to sort itself out how to walk around and things, which is more difficult. So on wheels, at least it's stable to start with. The sensors on there, we'll see, are fairly simple to start with. But uh, again, you, you put whatever sensors on it you want um, and it is linked via a network now this is interesting in itself this can be any network you want you know, it can be an intranet it can be the internet it, it means that the the body and the brain can be in completely different places but of course we know that's true for humans you, your brain could be somewhere different to your body if you wanted uh, if we knew how to do it uh, it doesn't have to be in the same place um, and then the brain is, this is an MEA, multi-electrode array. So it's like a little dish with an array of electrodes on which we grow the brain, the biological brain. What is it? Um, well, basically, the, the first way of doing it, the simplest way, is taking rat embryos. So literally at Reading we have um, a place where there are lots of rats that are pregnant. And uh, as early as we can with the embryos, we take the embryos, take out cortex from the embryos, um, a whole bunch of neurons essentially, separate them, the neurons, just put them in a little test tube with enzymes and that separates them lay them out on this electrode array, which is two-dimensional, this is important. We then feed them, so the, the neurons are in a little dish with electrodes, we feed them um, with a liquid with minerals and nutrients, very, it's nothing fancy, it's very similar to a, an energy drink, I mean, you, if the people that run take energy drinks, it's very similar to that. Um, uh, within 20 minutes, the neurons push out little projections 
nations uh, which will become the dendrites and axons as they link up with each other uh, and you get all sorts of things if anybody's researching into small world behavior you, you can start looking at this and lots of projections most of them in the end tend to be closely connected to neurons that are nearby but you do get these very long connections to distant neurons that are important in the way the brain operates one week you've got brain activity there you get a lot of um, the bursting the firing where lots and lots of the neurons operate which is very very similar to epileptic seizures um, but it seems to be something as the brains are developing they need to do this they need to go through this bursting to sort of bring all of the neurons into play we don't do that with artificial with computer-based neural nets maybe, maybe it's something we should look at bursting to bring all the neurons into play so that's that's roughly how it goes um, now what we're hopefully going to see <laughs> no, let's try. Ah, there we go. Um, this this is the multi electrode array, a close up. So we can connect on to these. These are the electrodes uh, externally. We can send pulses, typically biphasic pulses, the, the, the normal pulses for stimulating neurons, positive, negative, so you don't get a build up of charge. The, the black rings here are called Potter rings. They're there to make sure that the brain doesn't dehydrate. Um, that's where the brain is grown. These are the electrodes. We can see neurons that are um, the size at the moment. This is the technology there is. The electrodes are 30 micrometers across. Neurons, if, if you tonight dig out some of your brain cells, you'll see the small ones are about 2 micrometers across. Bigger ones are about 20 micrometers. If you find some that are up to 30 micrometers, it doesn't mean you've won a prize. It, it, it's sort of fairly normal. But the, the, essentially they're quite small compared to the size of the electrodes. Here's some where after a little while uh, and uh, so th these are where cultures have been developed to give you the idea highly nonlinear first of all you can see the neurons are different these are actual neurons that have grown for a, a while um, highly nonlinear you can see different sizes typically a lot of them are very close together and then you've got sparse areas where there aren't any neurons lot so you can see the connections uh, highly connected um, in some areas and then you know there's perhaps no connection or you might find there's a very weak connection then you it, it doesn't look important but it is important if, if you break it, uh, it the, the brain stops doing things so you can see with this how you can start to develop st stimulating through the electrodes and also taking an output from the culture from the brain which we, we take to the robot. Um, so here we have uh, this is a baby robot. Um, all it's supposed to do is move towards the wall and turn right. Uh, that's what it's supposed to do. But this is like two weeks old, something like that, in terms of its brain. So it's supposed to do that and then it turns when it's not supposed to and bang so it's not supposed to hit the wall but remember this is like a, a baby learning to walk this is just a very young brain two weeks old and uh, some of the time it'll get it right and some of the time it won't there we go that was good that's cool that's not so good there we go so um, what we can witness in the culture, in the brain, as the robot moves around is Hebbian learning. The basic learning, when one neuron fires and stimulates another neuron to fire, it strengthens the connection between the neurons. That's, you can witness this under the microscope as the robot moves around. So every time it gets it right, every time the robot goes to the wall, 
I mean, that's not so good, but it doesn't, it doesn't really matter here if it gets it wrong. That's not, if it gets it wrong in different ways, it's not important. There, yeah, so when it got it right, that will strengthen the neural pathway that did that, that made that choice. So what you're getting is the same thing for humans. Every time you do something and it, it works all right, it's actually strengthening the neural pathways in your brain, becomes more likely you're going to do that again. So uh, with some things that become habitual, you do it, you do it, you do it, uh, you do it without thinking, well in a way you, you are thinking but the pathways are so direct that you don't realize you're thinking about it, you're doing it without thinking, you feel. But that's what we can see in the robot here. Now I will switch to the robot after two months. So this is the same robot we're going to see. All it's been doing, I mean it's a simple thing, it's taking an ultrasonic sense, a sonar sense, which gives an indication of distance, and it's trying to turn when it comes to the wall. And, and that was after two weeks. We will now see the same robot after two months, where that's what it's been doing. And to be honest, I shouldn't sort of introduce a video saying this is boring, but it will be quite boring, as you'll see, because the robot, here we go. So you saw what it was like at an early age. There we go, picks it up quite early on, confident, no problem at all. There we go. I mean, it, it's, it, I say it's boring, really. I mean, the, the row's just picking up the signals. And I think this, this particular sequence I've picked was a very good, you know, this was the top student in the class as far as the brain um, developed. I, I think we go through here, as far as I can remember, it doesn't actually hit the wall at all, which is unusual. Usually, um, it, it might make a mistake occasionally and hit the wall. It didn't quite get the signal or it, it was thinking about something else at the time or whatever it happens to be. So you get, uh, we, we would typically have 25 to 30 brains developing at any one time, so they have to timeshare the body essentially, um, and then so we can compare the development of the brains, and some of them you get, like this one, yeah, it's very confident, it's swaggering around, yeah, I can turn right here, no problem, and then you get others that can be hesitant and are not sure what they're doing, and oh, is there a war? there, I mean, maybe I'll go left, no, maybe I'll go right, it's a bit like that. We, we also give it a bit more to do, sometimes it can turn right or left and it has to decide what it's going to do, and some of them you get habitually decide, I'm going to turn right all the time, I know what I'm doing, and some will change, some will start to go backwards a bit, and so you get all sorts of different, some of them can, can do funny things in corners from just when you think it's got it sorted out and it'll start swinging around in a corner just you know, maybe a little bit schizophrenic or something like that. But you can see the whole point of looking at what's going on in the brain and trying to relate that to other things. But I mean, it, it, I told you, it's boring, isn't it? It's just going around and it's not. But you can watch it like a goldfish in a bowl, I guess. Observations. Hebbian learning, clearly we can observe. Um, other reinforcement learning with chemicals, yes, we, we can go in and enhance growth in areas or restrict growth. So we can reward and punish chemically, electrically, I don't know, um, uh, you know, if we could find a way of applying electrical or electrochemical stimulation, then of course we'd, we'd be doing it to all our students. So, junk, you will learn this and so on. So, if we can do that, it will have widespread appeal, I'm sure. Sleep time. Uh, of course, a lot of the time the culture is in the incubator. It has to be kept at 37 degrees centigrade, and uh, but it's still it's still active. The brain is still sending what appear to be um, representative signals within it, even when it's not connected to its body, which gets very you know very Kafkaish. Well, what the, what is it thinking about when it's not in its body? Um, typically, 100,000 brain cells are involved for the rat culture. Um, we don't count them individually, of course. I mean, that's, uh, that's it's sort of it's the sort of thing they do up at Oxford where they, where they haven't got anything else to do. But we, our students try and do some research. So, um, I mean, it could be maybe up to 150,000 um, is about the tops. But it varies. It, it's very, uh, very rough 100,000. But that's a typical figure. Of course, that 
in, in comparison, the human brain, 100 billion is the typical figure, because if there are any Americans here, we're told it's 200 billion for Americans, but for the rest of us, it's 100. <laughs> It's just to get me shot. Uh, 100 billion is a typical figure. I'm just quoting. I'm just, <laughs> just quoting. Um, if you read Time magazine, then it's... Anyway, there we go. Uh, the neuro, this is interesting. Neuron speciality. I mean, as we'll see, some philosophical complaints could be, yes, but in the human brain, the neurons specialize. We have some which deal more with sensory signals, some which... Well, the, you actually get this. You, you get with the brain the, the neurons that are around the, the electrodes we use for stimulation become unidirectional. They, they only really operate in a sensory sense. Others motor some of them in sending signals from place to place. And then, quite amazingly, there seem to be some neurons that sort of sit back and start to tell the other neurons what to do, which is interesting. So, I mean, th this is very much... This is what we observe. Actually publishing that at this stage would be very difficult. But there appears to be a brain within a brain. The brain is doing the controlling of what the, the lower neurons... Can I call them lower neurons? I'm not sure. But the sensory and motor neurons that are just doing their job. They're, they're sort of pretty boring. Then there are other neurons telling them what to do. Um, old age. At the moment, Steve Potter from Georgia Tech says he can keep them alive for about two years. But we find after about three months that they're really suffering from old age. They, they stop really functioning. You have to increase the volume of the signals and it's still, I'm not sure what I'm doing. It, it really is like an old person doesn't listen to what you're telling it and it knows what it's doing. And old academic, you know, I'm just going to do it this way. Um, now on to the philosophy, which I, I think is great because this, as, as you know, if you're into philosophy of artificial intelligence, you know, it's a big area. A lot of people have made big reputations. Daniel Dennett, John Searle, Roger Penrose made big reputations, which this really stirs up things quite a bit, as we'll see, as far as they're concerned. The problem being that the philosophy of AI till now has been based on a comparison, humans and computers. Silicon in terms of the computers, the humans, the carbon form and so on. So there's different technology that's involved and you can draw conclusions based on those differences. So can we pull some little nuggets, some important points from classical artificial intelligence and turn them on their head a little bit? Because in the future, We'll need more robots around the home. Everybody says that. We're the Western world, more older people can't look after themselves. We need robots to look after them. Maybe we will have robots not with rat neurons, but with human neurons. Now I say that in, in bold letters there because we have human neurons which we're working with. We actually buy them. I say human. We buy them from an American company. So they're, they're American. No more American. American jokes. So as close to humans as we can get, but they're American. Um, so we have human neurons which we're working with and so on. So th this is quite possible to have human neurons. They don't have to be rat neurons. All sorts of ethical questions with that, but so on. Uh, they're actually, from the human neurons we have are from abortions. Um, now we don't do the abortions, we just buy them from the company. Uh, but it could be, of course, you know, maybe the human neurons in your robot around the home um, could come from a loved one or, or you know maybe if, if they're going to die you'd say well let's have some of your brain cells and put them in or it could be yourself if any, I know a lot of important academics want to live on well this is an opportunity just take some of your neurons just before you die and live on around your university um, the university here could have Andre maybe in the future <laughs> a robot version of yourself wandering the corridors for years to come. Um, of course, it doesn't have to be in a little wheeled robot. It can be a walking robot or humanoid. And it raises questions, you know, emotions. This now, if we're looking at human neurons in a robot body, 
Does it have emotions? I mean, you'd like to think if it was your brain, in, it doesn't matter, what's, what's the importance of your body? If your brain is now in a robot body, does that stop it being emotional? Does it stop it loving or feeling or being angry? Well, I, I don't think so. So, isn't this robot emotional? Is it conscious? Because this is nice, because it opens up all sorts of philosophical arguments. Um, ongoing, where's the research heading? Well, more senses, clearly. The, the, the ultrasonics are limiting. I have a student putting audio input in so that we can start communicating with the robot, but we're getting audio output for instead of mo just moving around that it can communicate with us. Uh, another student's putting a camera on so to give it some rudimentary vision, but you know, give whatever senses you want to give to the brain. Motor skills as well, if it's walking or picking up things, it, it's an open book as to what you want to do. The use of human neurons, I'll be critical there, is an very, very important. If we're relating it to human mental problems, then it's better if we use human neurons rather than rat neurons. Operating, I think it's called 24-8, uh, but 24 hours a day, seven days a week, three and six, rather than just for an hour a day. Immersing it in the body from the, the straight away. Looking at the environment changes and how that affects the development of the, the culture. This is one of the important points working with a group from Canada to culture in three dimensions using a lattice structure. Um, the pharmacy guy I works with, he doesn't like this because with 3D we don't know what the neurons in the center of the brain are doing. With two dimensions you can see everything that's going on. With 3D you lose contact with the neurons in the middle unless you start putting electrodes in which is what we don't want to do. But from a systems point of view it's great because instead of 100,000, th this is just putting three dimensions on the two dimensions. So instead of 100,000, we have 30 million, which is, this is, this is quite good. You're getting into the, the same sort of brain power as dogs and cats now. So this is robots with that sort of brain power. Is it alive? Well, the brain is alive. I mean, it's developing and growing. So, you know, does it, it again, it's asking questions. If, if, if you didn't have legs and arms, would you still be alive? Well, yeah, you would. It's your brain that's the critical thing. Um, dreaming, there's just all sorts of questions. When, when it's disembodied, does it dream? Uh, there's the questions, does a, what does a robot dream of? Well, what does this culture dream of? If it's not dreaming, what's it thinking about? What must it feel like to be the culture? If now your, your brain is in this robot body, what, what's it feel like? And, and how much is it dependent on the senses and, and what you can do? Uh, again, you know, maybe you'd like to volunteer, donate some of your brain cells. Um, lots of possibilities. Uh, maybe before death or even after death you'd like to. I mean, it have to be fairly soon after death. And this is a question. If you do donate maybe slices of your brain, would any of your memories remain? Well, you know, maybe we'll be able, at the moment maybe, no, of course, we don't know. We don't know until we try it. If any of you are saying no, then we, well, let's have some slices from your brain. Let's put them in the robot and let's see. I mean, it, the point is that it's one way of trying to experiment and seeing. They can be neurons that are just put there, separated, grown, but they can be. Uh, Thomas Berger in USC is looking at sliced brains and so on. So it's uh, the possibility of, uh, I mean, when I say memories, ways of acting, ways of performing, ways of making a decision. Um, consciousness, which is obviously the big question. Does the brain experience consciousness? Now, I'm, it, it, this is a question. It, it's, uh, again, if any of you are sitting there saying, no, it doesn't, well, let's, let's think about it a bit. If any of you think, yes, it does. Well, let's think about it a bit. On the brain we've got, typically 100,000 neurons. You could say size is important. It's simply not 100 billion. It's only 100,000. 
okay, may, maybe, maybe that's how it is. That, and that's really the technology that we've got. With the two dimensions, 100,000, it's not 100 billion. But with 3D growth, um, we've got 30 million. And if we now, because this is more philosophy, if we now look ahead to where we're going, it's really just technological. That's with the technology as we have it now is 30 million. If we increase the basic two-dimensional structure, it, this is about tenfold. We're increasing the size of the, the culture about ten times, in, if you like, in one dimension. We're up to 60 billion. So it's, it's not, you know, this is not way out there. This is, so, well, let, let's build it. Let, let's go for it. It's not saying, uh, um, which is more than half in volume size, it's more than half the size of a human brain. And if, uh, as you get older, your brain cells start dying off, particularly if you've got some problems. So how far is it away, which is important? Um, some, somebody that's had a serious stroke, a lot of brain cells died off and so on, in a pretty awful condition, our robot brain, uh, you know, could be, could be similar. Um, and, and the point is here, if you have somebody, an older person who has suffered a stroke, are they still conscious? Well, of course they are. Are they still human? Yeah, of course they are still human. There's no question about that. But now we're looking at a robot that has similar sort of brain, human brain cells. So, so well, you, you are, uh, uh, yes, you're human, yes, you're conscious, but you're not. I mean, how can we say that? Um, and and if, if we're opening it up, then how far can we go? Because if we're looking now at a, a robot with a brain of 60 billion human neurons, can, as Penrose said, genuine understanding, can we start saying this brain understands things and it's genuinely intelligent, as Roger Penrose said? If it is, then do we have to give it voting rights? Some people are now discussing, should we give robots rights? Well, here, is, is it a robot, really? Um, you know, could we, it doesn't take too much brain power to become a politician. Could, if that's what it wants to do, does it have to have a human body to be a politician? I mean, does Berlusconi have a human body? I don't know. Do, does it have to have a human body to be a politician? Or if, it's a, um, or if it does something wrong, can we put it in prison? Which is the thing, does the robot understand? If it understands what it's doing and it's intelligent. So it's opening up questions as to what rights all right, if it doesn't have voting rights, it was, it's not conscious, it's not, it doesn't understand it. How can we say it's not conscious? What grounds are, we don't, we don't want, I know some philosophical argument, we don't want this to be the answer, so we're not going to, a lot of philosophy is like that. There's no logical basis to it, we just don't want that, because we don't want to worry about it, we want to drink our cocoa at night and, and feel happy. No, this, this is serious philosophy here, we have to look at why, what are the grounds for us to say it's not conscious? What scientific basis are we using to say this robot is not conscious? Because if we haven't got a scientific basis, then maybe we have to say, yeah, it, it could be conscious. Um, is 60 billion still not 100 billion? Is that, it's just size matters, size is important. If so, if that is important, then we need to go and count the number of neurons in your heads and say, well, how many have you got? And we need some threshold on there. And I mean, some older professors probably don't have the hundred billion. They, you know, they have a. So what? What's the lower figure for the human, uh, for a human generally? Um, it, this is opening up. If size is important, we need to apply it to all those with human brain cells and so on. Uh, maybe we need a, a test of communication, something like the Turing test for humans, as it were. You've got to be able to communicate in a basic way for us to say, yes, you're human, yes, you're, com you're conscious, and so on. I have to say, 
Um, my mother has had dementia for a number of years. She has no idea who I am. Um, so I'm sure she wouldn't mind me mentioning her in the lecture. She can't remember anything. She doesn't know who she is. She, communication, there is none that I'm aware of at all. You can sit and try. On the Turing test, she would fail dismally because she doesn't communicate. I didn't even know how to, what a computer is and so on. But communication, even person to person, there is none. So maybe this is a strong statement, but in terms of some basic test of community, but I, I mean to me, she's my mother, she's human, she's conscious, I would argue. Maybe some of you that say no, size is important, would argue against it and say my mother's not conscious. Well, I, I, I will argue with you. I think she's still human. She's still conscious. So if we are using size, if we're using basic communication skills to say that this robot is not conscious, we have to watch what we're doing because it opens up all sorts of questions as far as people, humans that are conscious, are concerned. Or if, if we, what grounds are we saying you, you're not? If size is, oh, size is important if this is the type of body you've got, but size is not important if this is the type of body. Hey, come on. Um, maybe emotional responses are important. But if, if the robot has human neurons, then why can't it have? similar emotional feelings. What, what's the basis of our emotions? If it's not our human neurons, what is it? Where, where else is our emotions coming from? Surely it's from our, our brains. Um, maybe the robot must have the same sensory input as humans to be conscious. But now we're giving the robot audio, um, we can give it smell, there's a lot of researchers, some of you here may be working on smell and other touch and uh, vision, also we can put that, and more, maybe. But we don't, we don't suggest people who don't have a sense of taste are not conscious. I mean, I'm English, we don't, of course we don't have a sense of taste for food, that's natural. So, but, it, but we're still English, we're still, I think we're conscious. I, then you say you're not conscious because you're English, you don't have a sense of taste. Um, or people who are blind, you're not intelligent, you're not conscious because you, you can't see. Or someone wearing, see, wearing glasses, so you're not conscious because you're wearing glasses. No, we can't, stupid. So we can't start doing that to our robot. You don't sense the world. Um, clearly sensory input is not critical to whether you're conscious or not. Motor skills, let's have a look at the output. Uh, you know, maybe you say, well you can't, uh, um, who was it said, uh, Mark Tilden, the robot can't make a cup of tea, so how can it be intelligent? Uh, well, looking at that here. The, this robot moves around on wheels. Some humans move around on wheels. In, in fact, the world record for the marathon is not held by a two, sorry about this, those that go running, it's not held by a, a two leg, it's held by someone on a wheel, in a wheelchair. Some humans have no arms. Uh, or, or have robot arms instead. Ex wonderful research, helping people, uh, giving them arms and the same with legs and so on. Some have motor neurone disease, very limited motor skills. Um, but to suggest somebody like Stephen Hawking, who has pretty severe motor neurone disease, is not conscious, is not human, would be horrific, of course. I mean, he's a very intelligent guy, and somebody bought his books and so on. Um, so, I mean, I, I, think, I don't think we can say motor skills are the key, are critical. Functionality, in a way I've already discussed, um, but the, I'm reason, taking this because one philosopher has already started saying, yes, but the human brain has functionality. This is the key. Yeah, but this brain, the robot brains, have functionality. Um, some might argue this is important for consciousness. Some do argue this is important for consciousness, but exactly the same thing happens in the cultured brain. They get neuron specialities occurring. So if any of you think, yes, but in the human brain, you get this functionality, you'd get it in the cultured brain as well. 
what are we left with? This is to say the, the, the robot brain is not conscious. Well, all I can see is, is the old things for intelligence, nature and nurture. That's about the, the basic elements. About the only thing I can find, unless some of you, again, please shout up at the end if you feel there's something else, for nurture how the robot is educated, how it experiences life. Are we going to deny the robot is conscious because of its educational background, what it's experienced in life? It didn't go to the right school, uh, you know, so it's, you're not conscious. Uh, but if we do that, then we have to look at the education of humans. You know, I mean, a lot of humans don't go to school. They're still conscious. And, and is it, well, if you went to this school and this university is all right, but that university, well, of course not. I mean, I, it's absolutely ludicrous. We can't, I, we can't use education, nurture, as an argument against the robot's consciousness. In fact, if we actually consider it realistically, that our robot is moving around in our university. I think our university is cool. I, I, you know, it's a university. So our robot is actually getting a university education, which many people don't have a university. So if there's any argument as far as the robot's consciousness related to nurture, it ticks the box big time. It's, it's got it a lot more conscious than humans, if, if that is the case. So all we're left with perhaps is nature, how the brain got there in the first place. Maybe that's, that's the important point for consciousness, is, is how it, it got into being. Um, well, I have to admit, I mean, it would be nice to research this, but actually trying to bring the robot into being purely through a sexual act. Uh, if there's any women here would like to help me with the research, I don't know. But try, <laughs> oh, I'm not allowed to say things like that, I know. But purely for humour. Uh, if it bring in the robot into existence purely through a sexual act, I have to admit, probably we, we can't do that. I mean, it'd be scientifically really pushing things out a bit. But if we look at humans, we have test tube babies, even cloning is a possibility. So again, with humans, it's not necessary purely through the, the sexual act. Um, in fact, the, the brain cells we're using for the robot did more than likely come about through the normal sexual act. So in, in some ways, there, there's some test tube babies are, are less Na sort of natural, as it were, than our robot in terms of the brain cells. The only difference really is, is perhaps down to the length of gesticulation, how long it's in the womb and developing and so on. But wow, that's a, that's a very weak, you know, particularly if you look at premature babies that are being born 20 weeks and being kept alive and, and probably even less than that in some cases very, very weak uh, argument, and we're getting out of philosophy, I think, altogether here. I mean, I, I really don't feel we can consider nature. Um, so is it possible on any scientific basis to exclude this type of robot with human neurons from the class of conscious entities? Because the brain is made up of only human neurons. Um, it may well be that the robot brain and the robot itself is nearer the human norm than a lot of humans, in fact. Uh, so, the brain is an organ like any other. It is an organic machine. Consciousness is caused by lower level neuronal processes in the brain and is itself a feature of the brain. John Searle is one of the big names, philosophy of AI. You can see where he's coming from here. He's saying this, this thing here, this computer is not conscious. Humans are conscious. Here's reasoning. Now hopefully you can see when you look at that opening statement, now relate it to our robot with a human brain. Doesn't it tick Searle's boxes? Where doesn't it tick Searle's boxes on that? Surely it does. Searle also, in fact, describes an emergent property. 
The more neurons there are with greater complexity, it eventually results in the consciousness exhibited by humans. Is, I'd rather than put lots and lots of quotes what he said. So if our robot has a brain of several billion highly connected human neurons by Searle's argument, the robot's conscious. No question. Um, whatever its physical body. Searle doesn't talk of a physical body, so why should we, in a way? What rights should it have? Um, and, and particularly the following one here, if the robot has 60 billion human neurons, can I switch it on? Can I switch it off? Or should it have some rights? Size matters. Okay, we've looked at the moment, something smaller than the human brain. Well, what about if we go a bit bigger? This is just technology. Um, three dimensions, uh, we, we could end up with something that is four times the number of neurons in a human. Does that mean, does that mean it's super conscious? Super cell, if you like. If we have a robot with 400 billion neurons, does it, is it much more conscious than humans are? By Searle's philosophical argument. I'm not changing Searle, I'm not disputing any philosophy saying this is wrong. I'm so saying, okay, I'll accept this philosophy. By Searle's argument, we can have super conscious robots. That's John Searle, quote. So you are a robot. Final slide. Imagine yourself, now go Kafka, put your brain in the body of a robot. Your brain is more powerful than that of the scientist that created you. Yet you still got to carry little, you know, you're going round in a circles in a lab with silly little sensory input and so on. Um, would you put up with it? Would you complain? Now remember, you now have your super conscious, you have lots and lots of brain power, things like that, this st stupid scientist that brought you about. With those intellectual capabilities or more, couldn't you figure out a way to stop that endless? Wouldn't you complain? Wouldn't you sort out a way to get out of it? Um, what would you do if someone tried to stop you? Would you just say, yeah, I'll go back to the lab and go around in circles and do things like that? Uh, or what? What would you do about it? So I'll leave you with that thought. What would you do about it? Thanks very much. It's an interesting question. Um, I think if we're looking at moral, ethical standpoints, yeah. if, we, if we take robots even with a computer brain, then I, I would say the, the sensory input, the way the brain operates and so on and so forth, is probably by and large quite different to the way a human brain works. Um, the values, the what's right, what's wrong in the brain of that robot could be very different to what's right, what's wrong, what's good, what's bad for the human brain. And hence, although I'm not allowed to say it as an academic, I have to say, the, the Terminator scenario for a robot brain is, is a realistic one. For that brain, if it had the power, the capabilities to say, I don't like what you're doing, I disagree with your morals, I disagree with your ethical standpoint, and it could do something about it, so I, I, then it, it probably would, if it had the power to do something about it. So I, I see the moral, there's not one set of morals or ethics. We, even with humanity, we have different moral standpoints. I mean, we see that with the Libyan crisis, you know, the, I think this is right, and I think there's all sorts of politics involved with the moral standpoint that we come from. So even with humans, we have different moral and ethical standpoints. I think here, if now it is your brain in a robot body, you would have your own moral, ethical standpoint, what's right and what's wrong. And probably as an individual, 
people. I, I think as humans we have a lot of individual feelings that are important. The, the right for me to do something, not to be your slave. The right for me to go to the toilet when I want to, to, to do this, to go there. So I think this robot particularly would have a different moral and ethical standpoint, will, um, to do what it wants to do not necessarily what we would want it to do. We can even see some of that in a limited way when it suddenly learns to move around in a corner, which, why is it doing that? It, because it wants, that's what it wants to do. It feels it's alright, it does it. For the robot with the human brain, because it is still human neurons, probably we might be able to understand some of the morals and ethics that it's, it, it's, it's deciding on. For the computer brain, it probably would be a lot more difficult for us to understand, because we, like Nagel, what's it like to be a bat? We don't know. And what's it like to be a computer? We don't know. But the computer does, so the decisions that the computer, the moral, ethical decisions that the computer comes with, the robot, that form, we probably wouldn't understand why it's doing this, we couldn't reason with it, we couldn't bargain with it because we don't know how it thinks. Thanks. Which I think is what Turing was trying to get at many years ago. How does it think? We need to try and understand it. Okay, uh, so one quite detailed question. You have this movie about the robot hitting the wall and, and then somebody moved it into the center. So, so the serious question, what is the point of creating that kind of discontinuity into its learning and not, not one of that to recover in the corner? And the follow-up question, isn't there a danger that it will develop some kind of religious thinking, you know, kind of, kind of thought acting and moving? Um, yeah, I, I think the latter point, there is, a, it, it is probably, because you have to think now, this with the human neurons, it's like a human on a smaller scale, maybe, and uh, for us, where there's things we can't understand, so we come up with some sort of religious arguments to explain why this works, so I, I think it's very, very likely that it could come up with something like that, to say, oh, yeah, there is something more powerful than I am, which in a sense probably would be right in its case, whether it's right in the human case, we don't know. Um, the, at the moment, it, because it's very simple, the discontinuity in a way, I mean it might, it might have an effect long term. I mean there's possibilities there that it could learn to be dependent on the hand of God coming in as, and, and helping it out and moving it. And in that case, I mean we do find some of the robots, some of the brains, even after many, many weeks and so on, they still don't seem to get it. And this might be, that discontinuity might be the solution. It doesn't have to. And if it doesn't have to and somebody comes along and helps it, hey, why should I bother? Could be. Now I'm imposing all sorts of thoughts, but it, it's in answer to your question. It could well be. It would be better to help, to give it a start, so that it could learn to get out of different problems that it's in for itself. But that, that probably is true with with humans as well, rather than you know, does, should we be charitable or should we let the the creature do it for itself ultimately? So I I, I think it's a, an important question for the robot development, but it's an important question generally. So we have to stop now hmm. for other. Uh, you look at that. And that other questions, please address later. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Cheers. Thanks a lot.